that we would start. Hey guys, welcome as you join us here. Uh, we've been uh, kind of lifting up some local prayer concerns uh, that we have. Um, and, uh, and we'll start out with prayer. Lord, we give thanks uh, for your spirit that's called us. Um, we, we pray for those that we've been uh, discussing and thinking about this morning. We pray especially for uh, Jack, uh, who's in surgery right now, we believe. Keep him safe, God. Uh, we pray for your peace to fall on Pat as she waits alone. We pray for uh, Pastor Hooker, uh, who's, who's got a cold and been suffering from her for a while, and for Mary, who's... Uh, Who's, who's taking such great care of him and that she has some strength and, and patience and health too, Lord. May your peace be fallen on them. We pray for we pray for um, Reggie and Scott preparing for surgery. We pray for Lois who who is having uh, who's having a procedure today too. We pray for Peg who's brought her there that, that she'd be encouraging and face of Christ for Lois as she goes through this surgery. And uh, we give time now for other names to be said aloud. Judy. Hear all these names, Lord. We love you. Amen. Okay. Well, welcome back. Hi, Rodney. Um, Rob, Sh Rob Scheider might be on there. I did talk to Rob, and uh, she's, she said she's been on there every week. And I told, and this is why I bring look at my hand. It's like, <laughs> Rodney's jumping back. <laughs> uh, I told, um, I, I told her, <laughs> I told everybody that it, it, they don't have to say hi, but if they say hi, then I know that they're there. Because there's like just a number five up there, or six or seven, and I don't know who those five or six or seven are, um, unless they say hi. I think I could find out who they are, but then that would involve me putting on my glasses and looking and stuff. So, hi, <laughs> Pat. Um, so, uh, so good. So that that's wonderful. The uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about today is that I got some new brown socks and. Do, do, do these like clash, right? Because this is like a funky color of brown pants, isn't it? They look just fine. They look good. Do, 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 you, do you think the brown, aren't, aren't the brown a little too close? No, no. they're fine. You, you can sure? tell the difference where your pants in and your socks start yeah. huh. in your shoes. And you go with your shirt. Oh, you're okay. all good. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Good morning. Chris Kuhn joined us. I don't know. They look a little weird. I think these pants are hard to. They're not quite khaki, they're like the... Well, they're not they're... white socks, so you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because my day's over. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, it's pants are mustard. It's yeah. Pants. That's hard yeah. to... Yeah, so, 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 yeah, so they kind of fool me. So every now and then I put something on and I go, ooh. Well, put yeah. a red pair, be mustard and ketchup. And I'm not really good. <laughs> I'm not, and Paige is gone. My wife is gone before I leave. No, they look good. So I usually have to dress myself. So. <laughs> so if I had her help, I, I'd, I'd be better off. So I have, uh, yeah. I don't have a problem. I need to be back to my childhood days with my, all I had to do was match up the bear and the bear, and I could wear that outfit. And, and the grapes in your underwear go in the back. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my son learned. Grapes go in the back. That's funny. Yeah, that's funny. Um, hey, so here's what we're going to do. Uh... I say the same, same stuff, don't I? Why didn't I bring my glasses? <laughs> um, I do got these right here that I can hold in my pocket here. No, there's no word about Jack Speakman. Uh, no, and I don't have Halloween socks, Chris. They're just normal. They're just normal brown socks. Chris. I'm not flexible enough to show you my socks, but, but they're, they're, just, they're just normal brown socks. Halloween would look good. So there you go. Um, okay, hey, we're ready. Uh, we had a really nice discussion with this on the men, uh, with the men on Tuesday, um, and that's really what I what I want. I want this to be as much discussion as possible uh, about. We're going to do the last two verses of, um, of this, and I'm just going to start by reading the whole thing again. 
Paul, a, a servant of Jesus Christ. Oh, and Chris, you're not on my list. Um, so if you want to send me an email at pastorcarlmessianlutheran.net, I'll send you one of these every week. So if you join us again, you, you can have the, the worksheet. It's not really necessary to have the worksheet, but it might make it easy. And so we're reading Romans 1, 1 to 17. Romans 1, 1 to 17. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So first I want to thank you through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of the Son, is my witness, that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you, so that I might share with you some spiritual gifts to strengthen you, or rather, so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as I have among the rest of the Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also here in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith and for faith. For as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. So we talked last week about that, that there's this, hi Kathy, we talked um, last week that, that that's just a complicated language, especially the first and the third paragraph. And, and I know when I'm listening to it, I just kind of glaze over, and, and I'm guessing that a lot of you, when you listen to it, just kind of glaze over. The, the middle part is easier to hear because it's more of a narrative, um, and the language isn't complicated. But the first two, and probably because, and I don't know this for sure, but I bet you Paul is being really careful in that first paragraph on what he's saying. And so, and so he's picking just the exact right words that he wants to use. Where he's kind of uh, talking in the second one that makes it easier to hear. That'd be my guess. Um, <clears throat> so last week we said that the gospel, it's important for us to be able to, to have some way of communicating what the gospel is to people. And the gospel is good news of that, that what God has done. Uh, the good news of what God has done. And so, and so Paul communicates the gospel with this sentence here. And we talked that you could you can use all sorts of sentences for the gospel, <laughs> that there is not necessarily an exact right one, but uh, but each of us, in our own context and our own way of speaking, should be able to tell what God's good news is. And so, so I kind of wanted to start there again, just just real briefly. What is the gospel? What, what do you think? What do you think the sentence? should be, or if you don't want to say that, what do you think should be in the gospel? If we're going to say the good news of what God has done, what, what kind of words are we going to be sure to want to use in there, in that sentence? And people, you can type at home if you want to, too, and I'll read your answers. What kind of words are we going to be sure to want to have in there? Salvation. Okay, we're saved, Salvation, right? Yeah. Salvation, we're saved, we're rescued, right? Something, and so um, so if something is saved, then something is broken too, right? We're saved from something. Sin, yeah. sin right? And so yeah, so what I said yesterday, uh, Carol, is that um, is that I usually don't use the word sin as much when I'm outside of a like religious sort of setting, uh, and even in sermons, I usually use the word broken or brokenness more, and the reason is is because sin. Because our perception of sin is the sin of, of the bad things we do. <laughs> you know, right? Sin is looking at pornography and uh, 
stealing and, you know, I mean, go through the Ten Commandments or, you know, or dancing and drinking, you know, depending on what your piety is. And, 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 and religiously, what we mean by sin is sin is anything that keeps us from God. So it could be sinful for you to sign your child up for football on Sunday mornings. I mean, that, that's keeping you from God. Well, there's nothing wrong with your child playing football on Sunday mornings. In fact, that sounds like a wonderful thing your child should be doing. So, so, so we, so, and yet, and so how does going and having your son go to football on Sunday mornings lead to uh, brokenness? Is that it, it makes us further and further away from the family of God, so 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 that we are we are losing that connection with the, with that community that's promised to to live with us. Does that make sense? So something good can be sinful in in, in that sort of way. And so so usually what I say is that the world is broken, <laughs> and God's got a plan to save it, and we're broken, and God's got a plan to save us. To put those words together, right? Salvation and sin. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So, that, so I, I, that's that's something I would say. What else? Oh, redemption. God is love. Yeah. So um, so Stacy Stout. Hi, Stacy. I didn't know you were here. So Stacy Stout said, "God is love," and uh, I think uh, you know the, the most famous. Um, once I start moving that, then I can't stop. I, I think the most famous uh, gospel message is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to die for us and for our sins. Right? And then God, and then <clears throat> 17, we never say, and I don't know 17 by heart, but I'm close. God didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world and all, the, and, and all those who believe. Something like that is how it goes on. So, um, so it's a reaffirmation. Yeah. So I think, yeah. So, so I, I think because God loves the world and it's broken, God, God has saved the world through Jesus and saved us who He loves through Jesus. So you could, you could. I think love, love is a a, a good word. And then um, Pat used the church word redemption. And uh, what does redemption mean? That's a churchy word. To redeem. Yeah, what do you think that means, Sandy? How is it different than being saved? I don't think there is any difference. I don't know if there is a huge difference. I think I think when I think of being redeemed, I think of being ready for something else. Which which saved would also be, but but I'm being, you know, so so, so I, I go to the I go to the therapist for a year to get over you know a trauma that I've had and I'm done with therapy and I'm redeemed I'm ready to live life differently now because I've been changed by this therapist is that I don't know but wouldn't you be the same if you became a Christian well yeah, that what well, well no I, I'm not talking about the therapy thing I was just trying to use it as a, a non-church example but, but yeah but but whereas I would say that would be saved as much as I would be that I've got a new lease on life sort of thing. And uh, so I think, I don't know, maybe Pat has an idea why she chose the word redemption. And if you do, Pat, you can put that up there. But I, I think that would be the difference. Because one thing for sure is, is that God's intention, and this is where we're going to end with today, with Paul's theme for Romans, is that we live into this new world. Right? So we have been redeemed to live into this new world. So, but then you're responsible. You have a responsibility, which being saved doesn't make a responsibility, but redeeming does. Is that? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, we definitely have a responsibility. I'm not sure the responsibility fits in the gospel. And this is a big discussion we had on Tuesday, too. So, uh, but I think, I think being redeemed means that we have been given a gift that we have to cash in, right? So the, Which is another meaning of redeemed, right? I mean, you have a coupon and you you redeem your coupons. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah. So we've been given a gift and we got to we got to cash it in. And so when I baptize children, you know, like we had a wonderful baptism of uh, we had a wonderful baptism of um, Elena. 
uh, at 11 o'clock this Sunday. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, that gift that, that Elena was given in baptism today won't ever be unopened if Molly, her mother, who's a, um, who's a member of our church, doesn't keep her promises, right? And so, um, and, and so yeah, so the gift, and even then when Elena gets to be owner of her own promises, that gift won't continue to be redeemed if Elena doesn't keep her promises later. So that, that's what I, that's what I mean by that. Um, yeah, and so Pat says that she meant that Jesus makes us right with God. So a lot of people put righteousness in there, and that's what right, right with God. In fact, he uses the word righteousness all the time. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think when I'm trying to communicate the gospel to someone, I think I do it poorly all the time. And, uh, and, and, uh, but but you, you, usually what I want to do is, is I want them to hear that the world's not how it's supposed to be and that God's got a different future planned, you know? So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son is, is saying that. Uh, and that God doesn't condemn the world, which is why 17 should be part of that. But that, that God's plan isn't, isn't Noah's Ark. Where the, where the whole world is destroyed and one family gets to live, which is what a lot of Christian denominations seem to hone in on as God's plan. Even the, even the uh, Left Behind sort of series stuff, you know, has this kind of the whole world going to hell in a handbasket and, you know, in one group of people coming out of the wilderness again, kind of a new exodus. And that's, that doesn't seem to be God's plan in Jesus. Okay. Um... Well, that's good. So, so for my gospel message, I'm to say I, I would tell someone that the uh, that because the world is broken, and that God loves the world and loves us who are broken in that world, God sent Jesus to to reveal a new way of being in life together, and a life that'll last forever. So something like that. Um, and uh, and then. And then we had a big discussion yesterday of, of, you know, what is our responsibility to that? And should that be part of the gospel message? And, and that's what I want to get to here. Uh, but before I do, just one other question. Why would Paul be ashamed of that gospel? We talked a little bit about this last week, I think. Why would Paul be ashamed of that gospel? Yeah, that's how he starts. Uh, yeah, I'm, there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he says that several times in, in different places. Anyone want to guess? There's two different answers. One for the Jewish audience and one for his Gentile audience. Why do you think he might be ashamed of the gospel to the Jewish audience? Think about who Jesus is. Jewish. Well, I'm killed by Jews. Yeah. Why did the Jewish people kill him, Carol? Why would they tell you if they killed him? The Jewish leaders, I should say. So Jesus was the Messiah, right? According to us, who aren't Jewish. <laughs> and the Messiah is a Jewish Savior. And the Jewish Savior wasn't supposed to end up on the cross. The Jewish Savior was supposed to kick Romans' butt and, and, and make Israel a great nation again like David. So when he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, a piece of it is he's saying, I'm not ashamed of a, of a Messiah that hangs on a cross. Okay? That's a piece of what he was saying. That because Jesus is part of this gospel message, that, that God sent Jesus. And so, uh, so Jewish responsible for God sent Jesus, a, a guy who lost. <laughs> you know, and it's obviously not the Messiah, you know, because he ended up on a cross. So that's one of it. And then the other one is for the Greeks is that um, Paul's got a real countercultural message, and I still think it's a countercultural message. And that is, in losing, we can win. In serving, we become greater. In becoming a slave, we are free. You know, all these. All these 
Is irony the right word? All, all, all these uh, yeah. things that, that look like they should go this way, Paul wants them to go that way. Kind of the meek shall inherit the earth. Kind yeah, of stuff. exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Meek. That's another good one. Yeah, that. Yeah, and so that that's a real that's really anti Hellenist philosophy. Uh, and Hellenist yeah. philosophy, you know, you you were a great person and you acted like a great person and people treated you like a great person. That was. That was how it worked, <laughs> you know, that you were, um, and, uh, and, and then the only break in that is if you tried to act like a great person and you weren't a great person. Uh, but yeah, but you were, and so you were expected to treat a great person as a great person above you, and, and, and they expected you to wait on them because that was, because they were a great person. And so, and so Paul is, is given a different sort of message. I want you to join our belief that Jesus saved the world by suffering and servanthood, by suffering and servanthood. And, and, and so the Greeks go, whoa, <laughs> you know, that sounds stupid. And, um, and yeah, and so Paul said, no, and I'm not backing down, I'm not ashamed. So that's the other way why he said that. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, it's yeah. very antithetical to their whole class system, then, too. Yeah, very antithetical. Yeah, so exactly. They, so Christ was there for the slave, too, not just the master. Right. In fact, in fact, what the Gospels make clear, which uh, American Protestantism has always had trouble with, is that Christ was um, had a, a greater heart for people who were who were in poverty and and and, and, and outcasts and, and children and, and children yeah i mean yeah so the gospels really played this piece up and i usually say america protestantism is, is it great with that because because it makes the rest of us a little uncomfortable well well where do well where do good looking middle class white people fit into <laughs> into that circle right i mean because uh, we're yeah, because most of us haven't lived on the margins and and haven't been in poverty and how do we and and, and how do we how do we fit into that and um, and, and so a lot of times we respond and I, I mean American Protestantism uh, responds by kind of ignoring that piece and focusing instead on works you know that <laughs> you know that we. <laughs> living a good life, following these things that show I'm not broken, because I haven't danced and I haven't drank and I haven't, you know, these sorts of things. Yeah. So that, that's that's kind of this it. it's, it's a piece of us just simply being uncomfortable with a class system that we have, where we have people that we expect to stay in, in the lower margins, with you know, uh, a slave system that was part of America, that, that Christianity in America grew up right next to slavery, and uh, you know, and, and so we had to. We, we had to hold this together with with that, and so, so that, that's a piece of American stuff. Um, Thinking of the greater the whole world and outside of our culture, so how do you take that message to the Hindu, to the all of the zillions of people, well, zillions, that's the right word, but people <laughs> <laughs> in the world who are totally immersed in their culture and their religion, <coughs> and, but we're saying this is a Christ for the whole world. Right. And so, and I think that's really difficult. And, and, and I don't think I have, so what Carol asked, I'm sorry, you can't hear her. Carol said, I wonder how you take this message uh, of the gospel, that God so loved this broken world that, that God wanted to fix it and, and fixed it in Jesus and his suffering and servanthood. Um, and and sh and showed us a new way of being life together. Um, I I don't know. Um, I'm not really good. I'm not really clear on how to help people that are faithful in other religions. Uh, you, what I do, what I do is uh, out of respect for their religion, is just be real clear with what I believe, and then affirm whatever they hear in that. Because usually, when I talk to someone of another religion about religion, which I haven't done much, let's you know, let me be honest. Um, when I, the few times I have done it, usually they've affirmed like, "Oh yeah, that's exactly what we believe in," and then they might say a verse from their sacred scripture, or they, you know, or the action that they do. So, so usually they want to affirm that we're 
that were similar. And, and, and I'm okay with being similar, honestly. I, I think uh, uh, I'm not a relativist where I think all religion is the same, that we're all just worshiping God differently. I, I don't think I would say that. Uh, I, 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 do think that, I do think that Jesus revealed something unique and special that, uh, that, that helps me in a way that maybe my Hindu cousin isn't helped or a Muslim cousin isn't helped. So I do believe that. But other than, I, I don't believe that other religions are worshiping the devil and that there's only, <laughs> and, that, and, and that we found the only way to worship God either. Does that make sense? Does it sound like I just said the exact same thing twice? Or the, the exact opposite. Yeah, the exact opposite thing twice. I don't know. Um, well, I think it's, it's beyond my understanding is what I've come to yeah. <laughs> to realize that that. But I don't feel like I should go out and convert everybody mm -hmm. because people do have their own religion and. Um, but it so it's like, well, I just I don't understand this yet, and that's okay. Yeah, and so what, what Pat said is that she, she she likes to live in the <laughs> and just simply not knowing that she doesn't understand and uh, and, and that and, and that she doesn't feel an obligation to convert people of a different religion and um, I I feel I feel disrespectful to that person and in a way I'm not sure is valid so if I had a good Baptist here you know he would you know he would tell me that well. If you want that person to enjoy, a good Baptist might be talking in heaven and hell terms, and, and I probably wouldn't talk in that. But, but, but what would be true is that I think my life has lived better with Christ than without Christ, right? So that means that I probably think that your life would be lived better <laughs> with Christ than without Christ. And if I want my Muslim cousin to live a better life, <laughs> then, then I should be actively encouraging him to be to be more mindful of who Christ is and to, and, and, and to trust God's plan that's revealed in this gospel. But on the other hand, um, on the other hand, I'm not quite sure. I, I, I'm not quite sure that 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 uprooting uprooting their whole faith system that that they're already attached to uh, feels um, feels like the best Christ-like thing to do. So, so I guess that, I guess that's where I get confused, Sandy. I, I think perhaps actions speak louder than words. If you're a good Christian person and you're going to be kind and loving to any type of religion, then you can draw pants now and then if you want to, but that doesn't mean you have the right to judge their religion. And So if you're kind and, and inclusive of them, that's a Christian way to be. Yeah, yeah I, um, what Sandy said is if you're, you're kind, that you're, if you're a kind person and loving of your neighbor, then than to put them in, uh, uh, to, to make them a target, or even to make them anxious about their faith might be something that's not, and that our actions of kindness towards them might speak more of who we believe Jesus is than our words of who we believe Jesus is. I, I think that sounds right to me. I think, um, yeah, so it's a good question. What, <clears throat> one thing that, that gets to is our responsibility, and let's get down to 16 and 17. Kathy did put up a couple comments here. I think when we were talking earlier about when we're talking about uh, uh, why he's ashamed, she says it explains the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. So a piece of the gospel message ties us to the Jewish faith. I mean, our scripture is the Jewish scripture plus the, you know these added scriptures, a new covenant, a new promise, a new testament. So, um, and I think that's important. So it's important enough for us to know what a Messiah is. And then to also know why our Jewish brothers and sisters have rejected the Messiah. Uh, not because they're evil, but because um, it's not who they expected. It's not how they understood the prophecy. Um, and then the other thing that, um, that Kathy said is that this is good news for all. And that's what Paul wants us to hear when he says first the Jew and then also the Greek. So let's go down to 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay? For it is the power of God for salvation. So that's that saving gospel message that we heard, right? So we've already talked about that. To everyone who has faith. To the Jew first and then also to the Greek. 
So, <clears throat> so this is the word that, then that, that makes us start to ask other good questions. So this power is only if you have faith. Remember we talked about that a little bit a moment ago when I said Elena? That, 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 that there's no redemption. She's never redeemed this coupon, we said, if she, doesn't, if she doesn't live out a life of faith. And how we understand a life of faith is lived is lived in the community that the Holy Spirit gathers us into. So a life of faith isn't doing good works. <laughs> a life of faith isn't Following the Ten Commandments. Okay? All those things might be a part of a life of faith. But a life of faith is lived out in the community of Christ, in the body of Christ. Because we are a resurrection community, is, is, is what we strive for. Jesus has shown us what the resurrection looks like, and now we're trying to live out that. Okay? Is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. So, so in faith here, what Paul is saying, um, a lot of people put the words belief here, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and the, the difficulty I have with belief anymore, and I've said this in other classes before, so this might not be the first time you've heard me say this, but belief is an intellectual thing, Right? So believe is something that that you have heard, that you processed up here in this, you know, gray matter, and, and, and now you got your head around it, and then you go, yes, I, I, okay, that's how World War II started. <laughs> you know, I heard it, I got it, and, and now I have a good idea how World War II started, okay? Um, <clears throat> and because, as we're talking here, what do we do, and how do we answer this, and what's the word redemption, and salvation, and... And what's our relationship with our Hindu neighbors? Now we've, you know, now what's our... There's just so many questions about the mystery of God that for any of us to say that I believe this doesn't seem honest. <laughs> because, because if you ask any Christian, let alone, you know, the, the pointy-headed Bible people you guys are, that you're on a Wednesday afternoon uh, <laughs> live streaming or... Or doing this Bible study, uh, you know, you guys know more than than, than most all Christians, and you ask and you ask any Christian some of these questions, and they're not going to be able to tell you. Well, what does it mean that Jesus saved? And they're and they're going to give you some sort of Bible answer. Well, he died for my sins. Well, how does him dying two thousand years ago have anything to do with you playing poker last night? Right? <laughs> you know, I, mean, what, I don't understand. And, and then, then they're going to be flustered, right? So, so when we say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, we could say that, but I'm not sure it's helpful to anybody. And, and I'm not sure it really moves the ball forward for us into a resurrection life, to, to live this life that Jesus revealed. So I tend to lean on the word trust instead. So, and that's, and, and, and I see that word better in faith than I do believe. So I have faith in this, okay? I have faith that my wife is home watching TV now and not sleeping with the mailman, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, I trust, I trust, because I trust my wife that, that she's, that, that she's not going to break our marital vows and sleep with the mailman. So I have, I have faith that she's not doing that, right? I mean, that's. Uh, and, and so faith is a part of living into that community, getting to know God. The only way we trust someone is by living with them, is, is, by, being, is by being in a relationship with them. And we learn how to trust them, right? So sticking with that marital stuff, that's, that's why when, when people break their marital bonds, it's really, really tough to, to win that trust back. And, 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 and most often, marriages break up because of that, because, because that trust is, is so tender that, that, that you can't break it back, that you can't bring it back. So, so faith and trust seem like better words to me than believe. So, that, so there's my long sermon that you guys had to listen to about that. What, 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 do, you, what do you think? So everyone who has faith, who trusts that God's salvation, do you like that or not, or... The Apostles' Creed, it says, I believe in God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Believe is okay. 
believes all over the Bible. Yeah, but faith is something that is a result of believing. You have to, it's a gift. Right. So usually when I hear the word believe, I just put the word trust now. I mean, I, I, I just I just stop seeing the word believe, and I, and I put the word trust. Because belief is intellectual, right. and trust is spiritual, uh, um, or in your heart. So then, yeah, uh, and it's even a directional thing, too, right? So I'm going to lean this way because I trust that this way is the right way to lead. So it just feels like a richer word than believe. And believe me, <laughs> I... You know, I've done all sorts of intellectual stuff, so I, I'm not saying we're, 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 we need to not worry about tearing apart what the word redemption means and salvation means. I think that's helpful. That's why we're here. I'm, I'm just not sure. And I guess it, I, I guess maybe, now that I'm just rambling, um, I think a lot of it has to do with just that believer's prayer, you know, that, that, that some denominations have that just has never made a lot of sense to me. You know, that if we, if we simply kneel and ask God, if we admit that we're sinners and ask God to come into our hearts, then we're saved. I don't think we're not saved if we do that. I'm just not sure how my life has changed after I've said that prayer. Whereas if I live this life trusting God in community, then, then, then it feels like something has changed about Carl's place in the world. So that so maybe that's a piece of it too. Is everyone oh, awake out there? You guys uh, falling asleep? Confirmation Probably. when you kneel and you Uh-huh. How is that? Is that the beginning of growing your faith? Is that the confirmation? <clears throat> no, confirmation we believe is just uh is just a transition where you're gonna own your own faith rather than your parents being responsible for it any longer. Uh -huh. So you're affirming the actual word in the ritual is affirmation. So you're so you're affirming your baptism. You're saying, yeah, what happened back then, I'm a part of that now. Whereas before that, your parents were the ones, and now you're saying, I'm... Um, but it's still your responsibility to grow your faith. Then. It's still your responsibility. I think it's always your responsibility mm -hmm. to grow your faith. Yeah, I don't think that changes. Ever. I don't think that changes ever. And you know, is it with adult kids. You know, that... <laughs> You know, adult kids. Um, you know, who <clears throat> I'm sure, <clears throat> I'm sure most of you raise your adult kids in the church, and, and probably most of those kids aren't going to church. Um, you know, that's um, so, and, and that's not because your adult kids are bad, and, and that's not because you did a bad job. I honestly think it's because the church does a bad job. I would, bl I would blame the church if the church, the church just doesn't do well. Um, Communicating to young people, being active and lively for young people. We seem to lose them in high school. Mm. Confirmation after eighth grade—that's when they drop off. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and there's all sorts of reasons for that. That mm -hmm. are part of the church's responsibility and part of the family's responsibility. Uh, a lot of my families, we tell them every year when we gather in ninth grade that um, <laughs> this is what I told my youth. Back when I was a youth minister, and it's what I encouraged our youth ministers here to say, is that um, if you can if you can force your kids to go to high school youth group uh, through ninth and tenth grade, you're going to have a better chance of planning that seed of faith that might last them. I said if you give them the option of going or not, then they're not likely to come. And then I always say. If it sucks and they're like screaming and they don't want to go, well, then don't make them go. <laughs> but you need to make this opportunity available to them or they just simply won't do it. And, and that's what I mean by force. Uh, I don't mean driving them in the car. I mean <laughs> saying, hey, it's Sunday night. You, you want to go to the youth tonight? No, nah, I don't know. I'm kind of tired. Why don't you go tonight? And, uh, you know, and, and we'll do that. That's what I mean. I mean, you know, that's because if you don't, well, you know, you know, a 14 or 15 year old. You gotta like get a forklift to move them, <laughs> <laughs> you know? and uh, and that also means then that you prioritize that in your life too. When your fourteen or fifteen year old comes home and says that they want to join a band and they're gonna practice on Sunday nights, you say, well, the band's great, but Monday night practice is bad because we have youth group that sort of thing. So, so I, I I do think parents have some responsibility in helping our youth stay active, but but I think having horrible youth groups and 
the ones that aren't re represented in the resurrection are, are responsible too, meaning that they get bullied just as bad at youth group as they are in school. It's not a safe place. So why would they go to youth group? And, um, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, okay. So there we go. Oh, someone, someone's on here. Oh, hi, Joyce. Um, this is, yeah. So Joyce shared that, uh, I've always been a believer and have a strong faith and that my mom and dad instilled that in me. Um, and I love, she loves Sunday school as a, as, a, as a girl. Sort of that being raised in the midst of the church and learning these intellectual things that help hold, hold this all together and why you would trust God. So, so, so that's a good reminder that we're not divorcing, I'm not divorcing myself from, from intellectually understanding who Jesus is and how Jesus saves. What I'm, what I'm saying is, is that to live that salvation life, I don't think it's only believing. I, I think it's leaning into this relationship and trust in that relationship. I like your wording that no belief is a head thing. And I, when you say leaning into and trusting, I like that wording because mm -hmm. that sounds like then you're moving forward. You're a part of the world, but you're living in a Christ-like way. You're not just saying, okay, yeah, I believe that, but that mm -hmm. makes sense. But instead, you're actually living it. Yeah, and if you didn't hear that, Carol just said she thought I was really smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, and, and the other thing too is it adds to our humility, right? Yeah. Because because I believe different things than my friends here in Reynoldsburg at these other churches believe. So intellectually, I think differently about who Jesus is and what Jesus. And, and, and what Jesus hopes for us than my friends do. But we both trust and have faith in the same God. And, and, and I feel like I can say that fully and confidently with my, uh, with at least the pastors that I know here in town. Uh, so, so I don't know if my understanding, my intellectual understanding is any better than theirs, but I know it gets us to a real similar space. So I am kind of a Christian relative. Remember I said I wasn't a religious relativist? I am sort of a Christian relativist. That I, I think Lutheranism is the clothes that fit the best for me. Uh, but I don't think it's necessarily the clothes that fit the best for everybody um, as far as Christianity goes. So I want to get to this last sentence here. Or this, not uh, this, <clears throat> where he says, revealed through faith for faith. So N.T. Wright, this is, this is in the middle of your page here. Through faith for faith. So N.T. Wright, who wrote this commentary that I'm reading for this, suggests that that means from God's faithfulness to our human faithfulness. Okay? So through faith, for faith. For in it, the gospel of the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith. So to back up, righteousness of God. Remember I said righteousness and justice are the same word? So the justice of God is revealed about the world. If the world is broken, what does God saving the world reveal about the world? As far as justice goes. Is the world broken because the world is screwed up? Yes. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and, and so justice would say... That Noah's Ark makes sense. So justice would say that Noah's Ark makes sense. You know, I gave you a shot at this world. I'm just going to flood it all, kill everything, and we're going to start all over again. But what does Jesus reveal about God's justice? That God's justice is mercy. Mm -hmm. That, that, that instead, of, instead of destroying the world, God's going to recreate the world in resurrection. God's going to give us a new way of living together. Um, God's going to heal the world, would be another way of saying that. God's going to fix our brokenness. So when Paul says the righteousness of God is revealed, what Paul means by that is that God's love for everybody, which is why he says first to Jew and the Greek right after that, 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 that the justice of God isn't just for some particular people, one boat, <laughs> in the midst of this, the justice of God is for everybody. That God's hurt, 
God's heart hurts for all the brokenness that's in this world. Okay? And, uh, and, and then, he, then Paul has this weird saying of through faith for faith. And Wright says that that suggests that we say from God's faithfulness to our human faithfulness. And then I wrote this next line. So what that might mean is because God is faithful, we can receive God's gift and trust it. Okay? So God is faithful to the world that God created. God broke the world. What did he do at the end of the Noah's Ark thing too, as long as we're on Noah's Ark? He promised never to destroy the world again. That's what the rainbow is for. So God is trustworthy. And because God is trustworthy, we can trust God. And so my seminary professor who said, well, what's the definition of God? It's who you can trust ultimately. Who you can trust ultimately. Which is another way of saying who you can trust that won't let you down. And you know, I have to question people that are in terrible straits how they can have faith in that that um, huh? that you know never get out of poverty that never get that aren't stopped rolling <coughs> oh. that um, yeah 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 my my aunt lost two children. I mean, you know, who loses two children in the 20th century? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah two, two, two children, the owners, one at five and one at twelve. Mm. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you hear these stories of yeah, how do you how do you trust that God is faithful in the midst of of of, of just disaster, of just uh, of just unexplainable calamity and disaster, or perhaps other ex example was just poverty that you just never get out of, or or diseased bodies that you'd never heal from. You know, you, you know people like that that have you know that have had a horrible hand dealt to them all their lives of, mm -hmm. of illness. Yeah. And um, yeah, and what do you think the answer to that, Pat? Is how, how, how do they trust God? Well you know and yet some of them have the strongest trust in God. Mm -hmm. Um so I it, I'm this is something I've been wrestling with so I don't have an answer yeah. to it that um but I just I just wonder so many days well how do people have a faith that um, that things that it's okay? Because it's not. It's, so, <laughs> so I think maybe what Martin Luther and and I don't feel compelled to give you an answer. No, this is just right. Yeah. This is there is no answer in my mind yet. It's something to still wrestle yeah. with. Yeah, yeah and, and, and so the only thing that reminded me of something that I would lift up here is that Martin Luther made a big deal that our faith only comes from the Holy Spirit. So that none of us is able to trust God without the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us that ability to trust. And so, and so I think Luther would might say to that, is, is that is that because is because the Holy Spirit allows them to trust even though even though it, it makes the rest of our shake shake our heads. And in fact, one of the things that the gospels make clear is that it's harder for a rich man. <laughs> to have trust in God, and you would think they would be the ones who would be, you know, shoot, God's been good to me, I'm going to be good to God, but that, that doesn't seem to be how it works. Um, yeah, and, and so Luther would say that there's just something mysterious and wonderful about faith that allows us to trust God, even in the midst of the most difficult times. I, I, I would think but um, I, I think yeah. it's simple. <laughs> But in like in like the rich guy mm -hmm. and, and and the people in poverty or sick or whatever, I have always said no matter what it is, there is something good in there. So you find that good little piece, and that's what you concentrate on. Mm -hmm. So when you've got the poverty or the sick, there's maybe somebody that brought them a meal once. You know, but they concentrate on that, mm. and that, and and the, the rich guy, he couldn't care less about <clears throat> that little happy meal or whatever, because he's got it all. And that, I mean, it, it's very simple in my head because I don't get too complex. <laughs> but that's kind of how I. Yeah. So, it. so what what Donna said was that was. What, what, what the way she reacts is, is, is that even in the midst of great curses, that there's blessings. That's kind of the churchy language I usually use for that. Is that that, 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 there's, that there's good things that remind you that God's here even in the midst of the bad things. And that might be people bringing you meals 
uh, even though you're deadly sick or something like that. I think I'm, yeah, I definitely think, Don, I'm with you 100% on, on that. I have no problems with that. And, and I think living together in, as church strengthens that connection to the Holy Spirit. Usually I teach a children's sermon where I say, you know, you're, you're, given, you're given this flexible <laughs> tube that, to God, and your job in life is to kind of stretch that tube out so you can hear the Holy Spirit better and better as it gets bigger and bigger as you stretch it out, as you use it in life. And I, and I think, so I think living a life of faith, and I think we know from our adult children, the further our children get away from the church, and not because the church is a perfect place, but because it, it helps them exercise their faith, the less and less important God becomes a part of of their lives. I don't know if that's true. I wouldn't want to say that universally. Um, but it, but, but, but it, 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 it feels like that to me for my own family. So I'll just say for my family. The, um, and, and, and so some of that is then you just stop noticing God because you're not paying attention to God any longer. Um, and you're also not receiving those gifts of God because you're not in the middle of a family that, that's giving gifts of God. Maybe. Maybe that's saying too much. I don't know if I want to say that. Uh, I do want to say that Kathy McFerrin said amen, and I'm pretty sure she said that after I said that Carol said that I was really smart. Yeah. <laughs> no, no doubt. I'm not quite sure when Kathy said that. It's a sad thing to say that. Or <laughs> <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> so, uh, but we got to go at 12.30. So I'm going to close with the Lord's Prayer. Oh, okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Thanks, guys. Oh, yo, I was going to tell you, I, re I read something the other day. I have no Wait a minute, let me go find Oh, shoot. I just announced that on this. <laughs>